Hey guys, it's Ross, and um, we're doing some crafting today. I wanted to do a follow-up video for you guys because so many of you guys have been asking me. I think there's been a lot of uh, interest in grafting figs, um, and I, I think that has a lot to do with the previous videos I've made on the subject, which, um, to be fair, it really is a great way to propagate figs. I... I still stand by it. Um, I think there's many uses for grafting figs and even in in, um, in terms of selecting a certain rootstock that you may want to use. But uh, I think the interest is warranted is what I'm trying to say. And I want to make a, a follow-up for you guys and I, I want to answer a lot of your questions. There's been a lot of questions uh, and a lot of them are the same questions and I think I covered most of that in the first video, but uh, I want to really go through my thought process when I'm when I'm grafting here, and a lot of this can apply to uh, many different plants in terms of grafting, not just figs, but I'm specifically talking about figs in this video, but there's no reason why you can't take the same things that I have talked about in this video and apply them to um, any other fruit tree or any other plant that you want to graft. So what you're going to need here before you start is you're going to need some pruning shears, you're going to need a grafting knife, and I've used a, a Swiss Army knife, I've used really anything that you can get your hands on that's somewhat sharp. Um, the sharpness is quite key here, but you know it's not the end of the world, we're not trying to be graft heroes here. We're not grafting a thousand trees in a day. Um, this is mainly for backyard growers uh, and people that are really beginners to grafting. And I think um, the best piece of advice I can give to someone like that is to just do it. Stop asking questions and just do it. Because um, I don't know about you guys, but I learn by doing. I've failed so many times. I've, I've still failed grafts. I'm not a grafting expert. I fail all the time. But you know what? I keep doing it and I keep learning every time I do something. That's what growing is. That's how people become better growers. By killing a plant and then realizing how you killed it and then doing it again. The beauty of grafting and learning grafting is that you only need one node to graft. You don't need an entire eight to ten inch cutting. In fact, you don't want an eight to ten inch cutting. You want one node because one node here has a lower center of gravity. If I'm wiggling this around, you know, here's my scion wood that's eight inches or whatever it is. I stick this in the rootstock. I tie it up real tight, you know, do all the things I need to do. This is a really high chance of breaking. What if a bird lands on this what if I just accidentally knock into it, which I've done many times? Um, there's many different reasons that these, these graphs can break, and especially if they're longer. Having a shorter graft, a shorter uh, scion wood, can then decrease your chances of, of breakage. And breakage is a problem that you're going to have uh, just in general with these, you know. Um, the, the best piece of advice I can give you after um, just doing it is actually just to protect your grafts. Protecting them for at least two years is going to be key. I also have some things here that is going to help with that that I'm going to go over here in a second. Uh, one of them is rubber bands. And what I like to do is, you're going to see it in a minute, as I like to tie the graft and tighten the graft with a rubber band. And then after the rubber band, and after the parafilm goes on, the parafilm is a wax that uh, preserves the cutting, keeps the cutting alive, the scion wood alive, um, keeps it from drying out. I also have something new this year that's going to help protect it, which is this, uh, this tubing, this tree tubing that people use that a couple of my friends have recommended. I'm really excited to use it. Um, and it's going to really help with breakage. Some other things that I do for breakage is actually just staking them. Even even after I put the tube on there and the rubber band on there, I have two layers of defense for breakage. I'm going to even then stake it. So uh, 
Yeah, so that's everything you guys need to know is that we have the 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 parafilm, the pruning shears, the knife. We also need a rootstock. We need scion wood. We also need some way of labeling our our uh, our graphs because we need to know what we just grafted. Especially if you're somebody who's making many graphs, you want to know what this is. And I'm essentially going to use these aluminum these aluminum plant tags here, embosso tag, impresso tag. You can get them on uh, Amazon or eBay for pretty cheap. They're really nice. You just etch in there the name of the variety it is and it lasts for quite some time. But you need a scion wood, like I said, and you need a rootstock. So the rootstock, you want it to be quite strong. You need to know your rootstocks. You need to know how well they did last year and how well they grew last year to make a determination as to whether or not it's going to be uh, successful grafting it this year. A lot of that has to do with it. How strong is your rootstock? This rootstock right here, I could graft onto this. This is one limb. I rooted this from cutting. It grew decently well last year. It's pretty vigorous of a plant. It's a vigorous variety, uh, Brunswick, but it's not, it's not fully rooted in this two gallon container. I know for a fact last year, I had put this in a two gallon container quite late in the season it probably isn't very strong and while I will graft to it I'm not expecting it for it for it to take this particular rootstock has three limbs on it and might actually make quite a good rootstock it's in a three gallon container it's now in its third year um, and these limbs right here it should be able to support each limb so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna we've selected a nice rootstock and then um, finally you need a scion. And what I'm looking for on the scion in determining which node that I want to use, because I only need one node, I want a pretty decently wide node spacing. And I've gone through this bag right here, and I found uh, other, you know, this is the same variety in this bag, and I found the cutting that I want to use. And I found that you take it from either from the bottom or the top, and find the node that looks like it's readily going to pop, so it, it looks like a node that has no problem uh, popping out, growing. Um, sometimes you can graft nodes and they just sit there and do nothing because the scion wood isn't really all that great. But if you get something uh, you know, that has a really readily available node that could pop out, you know, that's the way to go. A lot of times it's the tip, the tip of the cutting or something that's really already green. I mean, that's that's your best bet. So I figured out this is my this is my node. I did my cuts. I took my grafting knife. I made sharp, few cuts to make this very thin, kind of like in this shape, as you can see. And you can also see in this photo here, hopefully, guys, or in the video, you can see that there's green. There's white on the inside, and then there's a, a layer of like yellow. And then there's a layer of very, very thin green, and then on the outside is a brown. And the brown is the bark, but on the very inside of the bark is the cambium. And that's what we need to make contact with the rootstock. We need the cambium of the rootstock to match the cambium of the scion. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my knife. I've already made a cut on here, and something you'll know you'll note is that. Um, there's not much sap flow. And right now I'm just going to put my knife through this very easily, not to cut myself. And I've just made a cut down the center of this. Uh, so if this is the, the rootstock, I made a cut down the very middle here. And now I'm going to stick this end into that cut that I just made. And here's the, here's the interesting part which I think a lot of people, uh, they, they'll tell you not to do, but we're backyard growers. We, we don't really need to be perfectionists with this stuff. Um, you do want to have great contact. If there's one thing you want to be a perfectionist about, it's to get very, very good contact. If you do not get the contact that you um, desperately need, you're not going to get the graft. The graft will not take. Alright guys, it was getting a little cold so I put my jacket on. But uh, 
I got the graft in place. Each side of the scion wood is making good contact with the rootstock. And now I want to take my rubber band and we're just going to go around the graft here and tie it off. Real simple, nothing crazy, nothing I have done so far it was really all that difficult. And you want to kind of tie this pretty tight, uh, but you don't want to tie it too tight because I've tied them so tight that I've gotten um, really some, uh, some girdling going on. And then I'm just going to tie it off here. And that right there is a graft. Um, some people at this point will leave it alone. There's many different things you can use from this point on. Um, but I like to use parafilm. Some people use some kind of wax or uh, wood glue or even like, uh, you know, various different things to get this to a point where the, the wood is not going to desiccate. That's the key here is, is wrapping this now, wrapping the graft union to uh, keep the graft union alive. We want to keep the scion wood alive. We want to keep the moisture within uh, these these two things. All right, everyone. So I have now wrapped the scion wood with the parafilm, and uh, I've also wrapped the graft union with parafilm. I also have my uh, aluminum tag here attached to the limb, labeled it. Very simple, and. Lastly, I want to support it further with this tree tube. And like I said earlier in the video, I never used this before, but it became it came highly recommended to me. And one of my biggest problems is breakage because of the way that I graft. Um, there's more, much more proper ways to graft, but this this is what works for me and. Uh, I recommend to you guys that find you know find the type of graft that works for you, and do that graft. Now, certain grafts may uh, may do better depending on the the type of fruit that it is or the type of plant that it is. Some grafts may do better uh, depending on the time of the year. What I want to do here actually is tie the graft not too tight. But I want to actually tie the scion wood as well with this this tubing here. I think this is probably what I want to do. And then I'm going to tie this off and that should help with breakage six months from now. That right there it's quite good, I would think. That's pretty sturdy. Um, this isn't going anywhere. So that's it, guys. That's the graft. That's grafting. There isn't really that much to it. Um, now it's just a waiting game. And uh, it's a little too early to graft here. We're in March. The trees, uh, the sap flow isn't really that, that strong. Uh, we don't want too much sap flow because that sap can then interfere with the cambium contact but you know this was really for demonstration purposes and I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope I answered some more of you guys just very common questions that I get and some of those questions are um, right here I decided to come inside and, and show you guys a little bit of things that people just um, are relentless about and and really are uh, asking quite often every single year um, you end up getting a lot of the same questions every year around the same topics like uh, rooting there's always the same questions about rooting every year there's always the same questions about grafting every year so I kind of want to go over this with you guys right now probably the biggest question I get uh, or one of the biggest questions I get is when do I graft when are you grafting, Ross? Uh, can I graft now? Um, well, I have a pretty big write-up on this that I'm just copying and pasting to people now because I get the question so many times. 
Um, but what I'm finding is that you can pretty much graft any time of the year that you want um, with pretty good success. Now, for me, I live in Pennsylvania. I live in a cold climate, short season. My uh, last frost is May 1st on average. Well, it's the end of April, but May 1st is probably the safest date. And what that means is I can, most of my trees are probably going to be awake by May 1st or the beginning of May. And that's when I will do my grafting. Um, that is the, the time that I think has the highest chance of success. So early May through June. And you guys can read through this whole thing if you want and pause it. I'm just going to give you guys the short version, I guess. But um, May, you know, the reason why May through June is so great is because the temperatures are low. The metabolisms of figs are not really kicking just yet. Once the temperatures are really over 70, especially at nighttime, then you get uh, a situation where the fig tree metabolism is really kicking. They're really growing. Um and the sap is really flowing and that's the key there is the sap so in the beginning of may and june the sap is quite low and then you get a higher chance of uh success that way i find and once you get into june and you get into july uh then the the sap flow increases um you can still have success don't get me wrong uh, but then we get into august and things get a little bit problematic in my opinion because at least here, I'm talking about here in my climate. Now, this might be a different month for you. If you live somewhere warmer, it might be September, it might be October. I don't know, but once we get into August, um, we're running out of days to get a really strong graft union and strong growth that comes out of that graft union. So even if I get a strong graft union, but the growth is like really thin and spindly, I don't want that because I don't want to overwinter something that's very really, really thin. There's a high chance of it desiccating or dying or breaking or whatever. So after August, the same thing when it comes to like um, to like air layers, we just don't have enough heat at that point in the season to really get a fully fully rooted out air layer. Um, and it's the same thing with grafts is that we don't get the we're not going to get the the thickness on the wood there. So that's one. Um, that's one time I wouldn't graft. Um, I would graft, though, and probably the second best time of the year is to graft in early to mid-September. I'm sorry, not early to mid-September. Um, the end of September to early August. And that's the best time. And the reason why it's the best time is because what ends up happening is it's very similar to the spring where the metabolism of the fig starts slowing down at least in my area fall weather really starts setting in by september 15th september 20th so by the end of september and the beginning of october fall is here things have really cooled down my first frost is november 1st so this is like the perfect time to graft in my mind because what you end up happening what ends up happening is that you have a graft union that will take, you leave the rubber band on there, you leave all the supports on there, the graft takes, but the bud never pops through. So you don't necessarily know that the graft actually did take until the next year. When, if you can overwinter that scion wood wrapped in parafilm, which it should have no problem surviving in parafilm, um, if you overwinter it correctly, it doesn't dry out you then have a situation where the new bud the buds that come out of the tree in the springtime will be that bud that that bud will then be a part of the tree and you'll have a successful graft for the next year it's more efficient that way i find because we're not cutting off wood in the beginning of the spring um to then or even cutting off growth to then stick in a scion in there and hope hope that it takes and take off all the lower growth this way there's no wasted energy in my mind so uh if you can make that happen go for it uh, i think it's the second best time to graft so i wouldn't graft in august well you can but i wouldn't i would definitely not graft in september um early early to mid-september late august here in pennsylvania i wouldn't graft when the tree is dormant so make sure the tree is awake. Um, 
Next question that people have been asking me is, uh, can I graft to newly rooted cuttings? Can I graft to dormant cuttings that haven't rooted yet? Uh, ben, uh, ben B, one of my good friends who also makes YouTube videos, he did a video on this. And while I like his video, um, and I think it's a really cool thing to do, I think the success rate of doing this is extremely low. Um, actually, even even lower with grafting to a newly rooted cutting. It really depends on the cutting, how vigorous it is. There's many, many factors here, but uh, you really have to be a pro at propagating plants to get this to work well. And my advice is if you're gonna do this on a newly rooted cutting, wait till the cutting is a year old. It's gone through an entire winter time. The thickness of the wood hopefully is really um, quite thick and um, it's grown up in one single stem. It's gonna make it really easy to get uh, a successful graft. And the reason I say this is because I've killed lots of rootstocks this way that I've grafted onto rootstocks that really were not strong enough and not ready to be grafted on. And by failing that graft and by cutting off that growth to then graft onto that really puts a detriment into that rootstock that's not strong enough. You may have better success with something that hasn't rooted yet, like Ben has has done. Um, there's a guy that really, I think Ben got it from. There's a guy over in some other country that does this all the time, and he has pretty good success with it. Uh, it's, I'm just saying that it can work, but it's extremely difficult to do, um, in my mind, because you have to root something and graft something and that just seems that just seems really difficult to me i've never done it um someone said uh how do i reduce the sap flow from um your trees because when you're grafting if the sap flow is too much this is when we went back to the point about grafting in the spring or grafting in the fall the sap flow is not very high but if the sap flow is high and you're gonna graft, what you need to do is actually score the cutting below the below the graft, and that would free up some of that sap to then uh, leak out of the tree at a different point um, below the graft to help with making sure the cambium is making good contact. Uh, my friend Steven also says that tea budding works too, so there you go. Uh, this person asked me about the growth below the graft. So this person had grafted something here. This is a Braba actually that's coming out. Um, not a clear indicator if the graft has taken if a Braba is coming out. This looks like a node here that that's coming out. So that might be a clear indicator. But even before this growth starts coming out, so see this bud right here, how this is coming out right here? And even this bud right here, which is kind of right here, this bud's coming out. I would take off the buds at this stage, this stage right here and this stage. At this point, what you end up doing is if you take this, this whole green branch off here, you're not gonna get a new bud that comes up here. And that creates a problem because now your next viable bud is right here. And that's not good for this entire limb because what the trees like to do is that anything above anything above a viable bud um, the tree doesn't really care about prime example right here so this is a node right here very difficult to tell this is also a node right here this is also a node right there so what the tree has just decided is that we don't care about this little extra piece here this is dead it's dead wood so that could eventually happen with this limb if this hasn't already taken, if this is taken, you're, you're okay. But if this hasn't taken, th that whole entire limb could then desiccate downwards and you would lose the entire limb. And instead of having two varieties on this tree, you now only have one. So I would have taken off the growth. It may be actually too late to take off the growth in this scenario. And you do want to take off the growth because it is stealing nutrients away from this bud popping through again it all involves how vigorous and how strong is your root system if your root system is very strong and can handle 
supporting this growth and putting out this bud, then maybe you could leave it on. But uh, I don't recommend it. I recommend taking off the buds at this point. The next question here, and this is um, someone that asked me about buds that were popping through the parafilm here. So we have one bud here that popped through, another bud here that looks like it's gonna pop through. It's very green, see how green it is? And in this particular bud, it actually did kind of break through the parafilm, so it started to swell. Um, but it's been a month that has gone by since that bud has started to swell. And that's the problem because that bud has swelled for other reasons, not because the graft had taken. If the graft had taken, once that bud swells, it's gonna continue to keep growing and growing. If that bud swells, it's probably for another reason. One, it could be temperature. The air temperature could have triggered it and caused it to send out um, that bud. Or maybe even the parafilm. So the parafilm, which is probably more likely, has increased the humidity around this bud and then once the bud popped through the parafilm the humidity escaped and was no more and that's why it actually stopped growing so um, if you get a scenario like this and the buds pop through but it's been a month it's been a long time even like two weeks i would really consider redoing this graft chopping it off at this point making cuts along this this section here and then inserting this back into the graph down here at a lower point and then finally my the last question and pro maybe even the most common question is what rootstock would i use um i've been saying for a long time the answer to this question is any rootstock that's in front of you i've had good success with almost every rootstock i've ever used if it was strong enough um but now I'm seeing and I'm, I'm finding varieties that really don't have very strong root systems that's just kind of innately part of their genetics. Um, there's a couple trees out there. Like, well, one is Aishia Black UC Davis, riddled with FMV. I would probably never graft onto that because it's not very vigorous at all on its own roots. I mean, that's probably the prime example. Uh, Hated de Argentile is said to have a poor root system. There's a couple trees that are said to have a poor root system. So I wouldn't graft onto those. I would graft those onto stronger root systems. In addition to that, there's two dwarfed varieties out there that I think are pretty dwarfed. Um, then again, if you put them in the ground and you have them in a really warm climate, who knows what will happen. But here anyway, uh, Little Ruby and Little Miss Figgy are two tissue cultured varieties that are dwarfed and uh, they're so dwarfed that I wouldn't recommend grafting onto them because like as an example my my little ruby which I will be grafting onto has three limbs that I could graft onto three viable limbs but the problem is those three limbs the little ruby is not vigorous vigorous enough to support three grafts so what I would recommend and what I'm going to do is that if you're going to use something like that, go with a single stem and only graft one variety onto that. It may be nice in the long run that Little Ruby being so um, not vigorous that you may have a situation where, and I'm still going to have to have a couple more years to come to a conclusion here, but you may have a situation where Little Ruby uh, just really does well in a container because you don't have to root prune it very much. Um, so that, and then alternatively, if you were to graft onto something that's super vigorous, like Alma as an example, is so vigorous that it will fill an entire container in one year, I wouldn't graft onto that because then you're going to end up root pruning so much that uh, you're not really going to have, you're going to have, you're just going to, it's just going to be so much work. Um, alternatively though, I mean, in addition to that, I should say, I did make a video on Alma and some other Ficus Palmata, Ficus Carica hybrids, or even Ficus Palmata. I made a separate video on the subject very recently. I think it's the most interesting topic in the fig world right now, uh, which is grafting onto those hybrids and what that could do for you. They're very vigorous and they're also super... Uh, 
FMV resistant and they are root knot nematode resistant. So if you live in an area that's quite warm, Alma is a good choice. I think Alma is actually about hardy to about 10 degrees, people have been saying. I know LSU Purple actually does really well with nematodes and it's actually quite hardy. But if you live somewhere that has just infested, the soils are infested with root knot nematodes, so you have a very sandy soil, and it's warm where you live, you may want to consider grafting onto something that's a ficus palmata hybrid or even ficus palmata. So that's a new development in the in the rootstock world. Other than that, people have been asking me about rootstocks that have like special traits to them, like will this rootstock make my fig fruit earlier? Will it make it be more precocious and fruit at an earlier age? Will it uh you know, do all kinds of other different things. We'll have any kind of disease resistance, maybe like to rust or something. You know, things that um, lots of rootstocks of other fruits are selected for. I haven't been able to come to some conclusion on that. And I don't think that uh, there is a definitive answer, even in the scientific community. If you guys can find a study on that, let me know. But as it is right now, I don't think there's any solid information on that topic. So. Anyway, anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you guys learned something. And if you still have questions at this point, um, like I said in the beginning of the video, my best advice is just go out there and do it. And you'll learn by doing. And don't be afraid. It's a little daunting at first, but it's actually quite easy. Um, and, yeah, so just get out there and fail, guys. All right? Take care.